Welcome. The Parsha this week is Vayetze, and it's known as a Parsha of exile. It records the exile of Jacob from his parents' home as he runs to escape the wrath of his brother Esav. He heads back to Haran, to the very place where his mother was found by Abraham's servant. He goes to the very same well. He meets Rachel there. He eventually marries Rachel and Leah and the two maidservants and heads back after 20 year sojourn there with wealth, with children, and really with the antecedents and the foundation of the Jewish people, the B'nai Yisroel in formation. And that's what this week's Torah reading covers. We're going to do what we've been doing and focus in on a particular relationship. And that's the two sisters, Rachel and Leah, who become co-wives of Jacob. And we're going to look at the quality of love and devotion between these two sisters. And we know there's a quote from Pirkei Avot. We've mentioned it here recently. Pirkei Avot creates a spectrum to measure love. There's Ava Tluya Bedavar. There's love between two people that's dependent on something, a love based on taking, a love based on something superficial and transient. Could even be a love based on lust. And such a love is not sustainable and it doesn't last. And then there's what Pirkei Avot describes as Ava She'eno Tluya Bedavar, a love which is not dependent on anything, which means ultimately that it's not about taking. It's about a deep commitment and connection to one another. And this is a love that lasts forever. And what we're going to look at, and the example of that is the love between David and Yehonah's son, David and Jonathan, David the member of the tribe of Yehuda who becomes the king of the Jewish people and establishes a malchut, a, a kingship that lasts through time. And Yehonah's son, who is the son of Shaul, the very first king of the Jewish people, that kingship doesn't last. And in fact, Yehonatan is willing to give that up on his own volition in support of David becoming king. So that's the framework here. We're going to look at the, and there's obviously a whole spectrum of ahava between the two. And, you know, what I would dare say is that in, in typical human relationships, uh, a love that begins more dependent on something, and and but that takes root within the hearts of the people involved, can grow and become an ahava she'eno tuya bedaber to a greater and greater extent. And um, and that should be the aim, because that's what makes it lasting, and that's what makes it ultimately meaningful, and that's what gives it a quality that we really think of when we think about love. But let's play this out in this week's Torah reading. And we're going to start on page 148 in the Stone Chumash, which is chapter 29, sentence Yud sentence 11, 2911. And the setting is this that Jacob travels a great distance to come to the city of Haran. He comes to the very well that we mentioned. And he sees Rachel. We'll pick up the narrative in sentence 10. And it was when Jacob saw Rachel, the daughter of Lavan, his mother's brother, and the flock of love on his mother's brother, Jacob came forward and rolled the stone off the mouth of the well and watered the sheep of love on his mother's brother. So here we have a reciprocal situation from last week's Torah reading because we see, we see here that it is Jacob who takes the initiative to water the sheep that Rachel is tending. And then it goes on in sentence 11. Then Jacob kissed Rachel, and he raised his voice and wept. So it's a mixed idea here. 
to kiss someone it was his cousin, his relative, but kissed her out of love and recognition for the greatness of the person she was. And why crying? So the crying is understood, Rashi says, that Baruch HaKodesh with a prophetic, a near prophetic vision, Jacob immediately could foresee the fact that Rachel was to be his wife, but that Rachel would not be the wife who would be buried alongside of him. And he cried. And, in, and this class is based on a presentation done by Rabbi Gladstein. So we're following his sources and our appreciation goes to him for setting up the structure of the class. But one of the commentaries asked and say, you know, you're just meeting a girl for the first time. You're struck by the idea that you're not going to be buried together with her. That causes you to cry. So the explanation given, and almost a Kabbalistic explanation, but after all, this vision came to him, Baruch HaKodesh, with a prophetic sense, that Rochel, this beloved Rachel that he's meeting at the well, and in whom he sees tremendous greatness, and in whom he sees is his, 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 the person together with whom he could build the Jewish people, this person would be needed by their descendants, by the Jewish people that would eventually come out of them. And that need would require her to be buried elsewhere. And that caused them sadness because it wasn't going to be a happier, happily ever after tale of being together, but rather that, yes, she would be his partner together with Leah together with Bill and Zilpha, the two handmaids, and becoming mothers of the future 12 tribes of the Jewish people, and set the stage for the blessings that were given to Abraham and passed on to Isaac to really take root within a nation of people. All that was clear to him, but was also clear to him that there would be a future moment which would necessitate this beloved wife, Rachel, being someplace else on behalf of the Jewish people. And we're going to look at that together when we get there. Let's continue in the narrative, and we'll move ahead to sentence 12, chapter 29. Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's relative, identifies who he is, and that he was Rebecca's son, and she ran to tell his father. Now, there's something hidden here in the words. In Hebrew, Rachel told, Jacob told Rachel that he was her father's relative. But the phrase, the brother of her father, which is what specifically said, points, and Rashi points this out, that they had a little discussion going on here. With this prophetic vision that Rachel was going to be one of his partners in founding the Jewish people. Rachel immediately raised the concern and said, look, my father, Lavan, is a deceitful, tricky person. That's what he's known for. Even though you see us as being destined for one another, beware, he's going to pull a fast one on you. Somehow we're not going to end up married in a way or telling what really ended up happening. So what Jacob is saying is, Ki achi aviyahu, that I'm the brother of your father. She says, don't worry. Your father will not outsmart me. I am capable, and as Rashi quotes the sentence in, in, in Proverbs, with a straight person, I operate straight. With a crooked person, I can recognize his crookedness and overcome him. And the Midrash says here, that at this moment in time, they made up a secret code between them, which would ensure the fact that there would be no switching in terms of him marrying Rachel. He gave her a sign, a secret simon, and said, this way we'll know it'll be our code between the two of us. So I will always know it's you and you will always know it's me. And therefore we can foil any plot that your father hatches against us. 
Lo and behold, the narrative continues that Jacob agrees to work for seven long years to earn the privilege from Lavan to give him his daughter's hand in marriage. And, and ya Jacob does this, Yaakov does this. He worked for seven years. And then they marry each other. And then in sentence 25, by Yehi Baboker, and behold, surprise, wonderment. Amazingly, this marriage that took place between Yaakov and Rachel, between Jacob and Rachel, as was promised by his father-in-law, a switch took place. And in the morning, he realized it was Rachel. Now, what does that even mean? In the morning, he realized it was Rachel. And again, what does Rashi say? In a certain sense, it was only in the morning that she was Le that she was Leah. But why? Because the secret code that was given by Jacob to Rachel, and they mutually agreed they would use to prevent any switch from taking place. Rachel had an, heroically, out of love, out of tremendous concern for her sister, decided that I'm not going to allow her to go walk down the aisle and then Jacob will read the code and she will respond. And then Jacob will say, this is not the person I'm intended to marry. And my sister will be humiliated in public. I can't allow that to happen. Can I sit by Rachel thought to herself at the embarrassment, at the disgrace, at the humiliation of my sister? I can't allow that to happen. So what did Rachel do? She on her own made a decision out of love and compassion and concern for her sister. And she said, I'm gonna give you this secret sign so that as far as the world is concerned, you are me and it won't be discovered until it's too late. And she does this. Why did she do this? She wanted to protect her sister. She was devoted to her. She had a certain, she had a tremendous sense of love for her. But what we have to understand here is we know how the story is going to work out and they're going to end up co-wives and there's ultimately going to be four mothers of the Jewish people that give birth to the 12 tribes. But none of that was clear at this moment. What Rachel was doing was out of love for her sister, she was foregoing the opportunity to be a matriarch of the Jewish people for all that she knew. And she was willing to do that out of love for her sister. Quite an amazing scenario. It's coded into the text by these phrases we're highlighting. And this is the Jewish tradition. There's Talmudic sources and Midrashic sources about it. And we'll see how this plays out over time. But this act, this decision, this loving, compassionate decision which Rachel did, which shows a love that's not only not dependent on something, but it's a love that surpasses all personal considerations and is so purely on behalf of the beloved sister that's taking place here. We're going to play this out through Jewish history, and we're going to come to see how this action that Rachel took echoes through history, that such a love, such a devotion reshapes the future of the Jewish people. And we'll see how. I want to add one more piece to the puzzle. If we move ahead to chapter 30, sentence 14, which is on page 154. So what's taking place here? At this point in the narrative, Leah has given birth to four sons, Ruvain, Shimon, Levi, and Yehuda. Bilha that one handmaiden has given birth to two children, and Zilpah has given birth to two children. So six of the 12 tribes have been born. And Rachel, this first choice, this maiden that, that Jacob recognized right at the well as to be an intended for him, at this point, she has no children whatsoever. But then a story picks up. 
Sentence 14, page 154, 55. Ruvain, the firstborn, went out on the day of the wheat harvest. He found dudaim, a certain plant, a certain fruit, something that would inspire fertility and evoke love, and brought them to Leah, his mother. Rachel says to Leah, give me some of your son's dudaim. But she... Leah responds to her, was you taking my husband insignificant and now to take over my son's dudaim? And Rachel says, backs off, okay? Therefore, he, Jacob, shall lie with you tonight in return for your son's dudaim, and they're together, and another child is born, the fifth child for Leah. What Rav Shradron points out here is something very amazing. We've just discussed the scenario. We've just gone through the story until this point. What's clear from this is that Leah, in her response of saying, you've taken my husband, has no idea that the switch that Lovan perpetrated on, 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 on Jacob, switching her for Rachel, only happened because of this code word that, Leah, that Rachel gave over to her. It must have been done in a way that was offhanded, that made it that Rachel not only out of love, devotion, protecting her sister, gave her over this sign, but did so in a way where it was done bitsniut, it was done almost in silence. It was done in a way so that the full dignity and respect of lay would be preserved. And even all these years later, after all these children are born, at this moment in time, Leah is still in, living alongside of her sister and sharing the, in the affection of their husband, Yaakov. At this moment, she has no idea of the extent to which Rachel has devoted herself, has, has subordinated herself, has given herself over to her well-being. Leah's not even aware of that. So what do we see from here? Let's just stop for a moment and think about the dynamics that are happening. And again, we have a home that is nurturing the future tribes of the Jewish people, each and every one of whom, each of, of these young men and the daughter that's going to be alongside of them. They're the founders of the Jewish people. The Jewish people now is becoming a nation. We're going from one couple, Abraham and Sarah, to two, a second generation couple, Yitzchak and Rivka. And now we're in a third generation. We have a household which is not only complex, as we talked about last week, a complex household, but it's a household with several wives, with many children. And you see that the devotion of Rachel to the upbuilding of this family and this marriage is to such a great extent that to protect the to further protect the dignity of her sister, she made sure that her sister would be totally unaware that the ruse that their father pulled off was only possible because of the tremendous, unbelievable, self-sacrificing concern that her sister Rachel had for her. They're living side by side. They're gonna to be together for 13 years as couples in the home of Lavan. And during that time, all these children are gonna be born. And it's built on a kindness and a compassion and a love that Rachel showed and a love that was hidden, that was kept silent, that was done bitsniut. That's the picture of this week's Pasha, which could go completely overlooked if we don't focus in on the insights that the, the Midrashim and Rashi bring to our attention. And it paints up an amazing picture of the greatness of Rachel and her love for her sister and her devotion to the future course of the Jewish people. Okay, beautiful to think about. But now let's go further. Because there's a famous Midrash which is based on a sentence in Yirmiyahu. And let's, let's we, you probably, you may be acquainted with this matters, but let's look at it. Fast forward, and I didn't look up the number of years, but I would say, let's fast forward 
800 years. We're now at the point where the Jewish people have had a temple in Jerusalem for 420 years. It was King Solomon, there was a split between the two kingdoms. In any event, the temple now is being destroyed. The first Tisha B'Av marking the destruction of the first temple. Who's the prophet? The prophet is Jeremiah. And Jeremiah says in chapter 31, so says the Lord, speaking to Rachel, speaking to this very woman, restrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, as there is reward for your actions and there is hope for the future, the utterance of Hashem and your children will return to their borders. This sentence plays out an entire scenario. Again, we're fast forwarding through Jewish history, but we're seeing how the entire course of Jewish history is built on this kindness, on this love, on this unbelievable stance that Rachel took. And here's the story. The temple is being destroyed in Jerusalem. There's a sense that it's over. As we say in the Psalms, Al Narot Babel, the Jewish people really despair. This is the end of the line. We had the exodus from Egypt. We came to the land of Israel. We conquered it. We finally built the temple. We've lived there for 420 years with the holiness of the Yom Kippur service. And now it's destroyed. Now Nebuchadnezzar and his generals have laid all that to waste. It's over. Game over. The promise of the world's history is over. So what does Jeremiah the prophet do? So the Midrash tells us that Jeremiah goes on his own accord and he summons, so to speak, Avraham, the patriarch resting in Hebron in the Marat of Pewa, and says, please get up, come before God, plead on behalf of your children that there should be hope, that there should be a return to the land. And Avraham goes before God and Abraham pleads their case and says, I was willing to sacrifice my child that I had at the age of 100. When I was 137 years old, God has not moved. Jeremiah next summons up Isaac, who also rises from the grave, so to speak, in Hebron, and also appears before God. He said, I, I, I laid on the altar, exposing my neck giving my life from behalf of the future of the Jewish people at your command. How could you not forgive our descendants? God's not moved. Jacob comes, also argues before God, and, 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 and explains, I lived for 20 years in the house of Lavan. I, I was ready to have myself killed in order to save your children. I devoted myself totally to raising these 12 sons, to creating the Jewish people. That was the only point of my life. God's not moved. Jeremiah goes and summons Moshe, also stands before God. I was a loyal shepherd of the Jewish people for 40 years. Explains how much he gave up on behalf of the Jewish people. No response. Now the Midrash tells us that Rachel, who was not summoned by Jeremiah, but on her own, she appears before God's throne. And she says, do you remember that wedding night when I, with no jealousy, without a pure love and devotion to my sister, gave her those secret signs, even without her knowing about it, according to the nuance of the narrative we're highlighting now? And, and I protected her dignity, and I, and I showed my love. If I could do that on behalf of my sister, surely you, God Almighty, can act on behalf of the Jewish people and forgive them and see to it that they return. And God says, I hear you. And that's the sentence in Jeremiah. So says the Lord, restrain your voice from weeping. Okay, Rochel, I've heard your cry. And it happens to be, where's Rochel buried? We know. Her grave is on the road that leads south from Jerusalem, the very road that the captives were led past her grave on their way to the exile after the destruction of the temple. She cried for them. She was, she was resting there specifically so that she could be awakened through their suffering and she could summon on her own the temerity to go before God and to highlight what we're reading about in this week's Torah reading. 
and of all the events of Jewish history, of all the heroic events, of all the great things that take place, of all the episodes in the Torah that we think about so often, this often overlooked and seemingly quiet, hidden aspect of the demonstration of Ava, a love for a sister that had no boundaries to it whatsoever. That's what inspires God. And God says, you are right. If you could do that, I can forgive the Jewish people and they will return to the land. And even though they will return and rebuild the temple a second time, and yet they will still sin and forfeit their right to have the temple, and they will go into exile again, and this exile will be long and it'll be fraught, we still rely on the voice of Rachel Imenu crying out from this on the side of the road in this abandoned little place. And that's what moves God, and that's what gives you and me hope today. That there'll be a there'll, there'll be a fulfillment of Jewish history in the world, and that there'll be an ultimate return to the man. And there's one more episode that I want to that we need to hone in on, and that goes back to the Mishnah and Pirkei Avot, because the Mishnah and Pirkei Avot in Ethics of the Fathers, when it describes a friendship and a connection and a love between people, two people that knows no bounds, they choose to focus in on the love of David and Yehonasan. We mentioned it before, David, the descendant of Judah, whose mother was Leah, and Yehonasan, a descendant of Binyamin, whose mother was Rachel. And in an amazing unfolding of events that's described in the prophet Samuel in the second book, in the first chapter, sentence 26, after Jonas, Jonasan had expressed the willingness said, yes, I'm the prince. Yes, my father's the king. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm standing ready to assume the mantle of kingship for the Jewish people. But seeing that God has other plans, seeing that you're more deserving, seeing that I love you as a brother to such a great extent, I can foresee myself being your servant and you being the king. And so when Jonasan dies, and when David is must beat him, when he's giving a eulogy on his behalf, he highlights it. And he says, Your love, the tribute that David gives to his friend, Yehonasan, is that your love is nifleta. It's a wonderment. It's an amazing thing. Me'ahavat nashim. What does it mean, Mi'avat Nashim, from the love of women? And we know now that what he's referring back to is just like my matriarch, Rachel, showed this unbelievable love to her sister, Leah, so too do am I, Yohanneson was inspired to have a, a love with no boundaries and no limitations. What is our takeaway from this? Well, we know that there's a paradigm in life that whoever has, whoever deals with people with kindness, with compassion, with love, that evokes compassion, mercy, and love from above. That's what That's the mechanism God built into the world. It's an interesting thing. It's not the service of God or to God that evokes this special compassion. Certainly it's a component and it's important, but it's the devotion we can have to one another. It's this opportunity to create a relationship which is love without limitation. Love without, as it says, it's dependent on nothing. It knows no boundaries, it knows no limitations. And so in our lifetimes, as we deal with one another, to whatever extent we can muster echoes of this act that Rachel took on behalf of Leah on their wedding night, and we can echo the devotion and friendship and the, that, and the love 
that Yohanneson showed to David and that David felt was mifleto. It, op it opened my eyes. It was a wonderment to me that a human being is capable of such devotion. You extended my whole horizons. And we know how King David wrote an entire book of Psalms just expressing his unending appreciation for God and the wonders of the universe. But it was the wonderment of this quality of love for a fellow human being that King David eulogized Jonas on whether it was Nifleta. It was a, a wonderment to me. And this is what we have to bring to life. When we think about these households, when we think about the fact that, you know, we remember that Jacob built the household of the Jewish people in the home of Lavan, the wicked one, the deceitful one, the idolater. And as he says it, it's going to say next week's Torah reading, in Lavan Garti, I lived in the house of Lavan and I fulfilled everything that God wanted from me. And that's a tremendous quality and a tremendous merit. But it's this quiet, hidden, heartfelt love expressed by Rochel Tolea that in fact builds the whole future of the Jewish people that sustains us today and that we need to bring out from within ourselves so that we can merit that this hope that we deserve this ultimate redemption. Please God, it should happen quickly in our days. Thank you very much. Any questions, I'll try to answer them. Okay, thank you for participating. I wish everybody a good night. Uh, thank you, Rabbi. Good night.